here with John Day, author of Cyclogeography, a wonderful book. I'll get a shot of the book in there. Imagine that's in my hand. I'll drop that in somehow. Uh, so today, instead of walking, look, cycling. For me, this is the first time in 14 years I've been on a bike. And that was in a completely pedestrianised city. And it says a lot about my relationship with cycling, John, that my aim for today is not to die. That's why we're <laughs> cycling in the Olympic Park. It's the only reason. The perfect place for it. So you're go we're going to ride these bikes, and I'm going to try and conduct some sort of interview. We're trying to talk about your book as we ride, and then we'll see what we get. Good. Excellent. <laughs> On the okay. It's a book about my, the three years I spent as a bicycle courier, working as a bicycle courier in London. And I suppose I wrote it partly because being a courier gives you a lot of time sitting around time that I spent reading reading about London and um, and cycling and it struck me that there's something quite similar about both op occupations right riding and writing and in a sense I guess I wanted to explore that image of the of the bike as a the bicycle journey is a sort of form of narrative and obviously the whole thing's kind of terrible but um, irresistible pun on psychogeography yeah. and this tradition of London writing that so the people I was reading in this time in this period of my life were I guess the sort of canonical psychogeographers such as yourself <laughs> and yeah no it's title, yeah but it isn't, is it? well it started as a pun and it partly but I do think, I mean, there, there is this, this great tradition of, of, of walking writing that, that obviously goes back far beyond the 20th century and to the Romantics and potentially beyond. And I was struck by the kind of relative absence of, of, the, of the bicycle as a vehicle for this kind of, of writing, in, especially as it's kind of, it has a strange hybridity that I found sort of attractive. So if you think of kind of, second waves or you know psychogeography proper emerging from all of these quite modernist impulses in the arts and writing and the bicycle seems to be quite a kind of modernist vehicle in many respects not just because of the historical period in which it was kind of invented and refined but in its in its standing as a metaphor for the union of, of bodies and machines in various ways and I did unearth this kind of interesting theme of literature dealing with this theme with Beckett and Flanner Bryan and Alfred Jarry, the, the French surrealist, who obviously is a kind of patron saint of, of a form of surreal and absurd bicycle writing. One thing that I've always found quite exciting, but also maybe slightly difficult to work out about psychogeography is how seriously to take the whole thing. Yeah. And he seems to be a good, progenitor of that confusion in some respects. What I would like to do in a sense with this book is reclaim its, its radicalism, not in a kind of protest, reclaim the streets sense, although that stuff's important, but as a kind of wonderfully bizarre metaphysical vehicle, like just a curious thing. No one knows how bikes work, they're weird. I've got sort of two fledgling theories about why Europe has embraced the bicycle race far more than, or well, continental Europe far more than than Britain has and I think it's partly to do with national identity and narratives of national identity that that the bike race can generate that I talk about in the book so this idea of which is um Bart's notion of the the Tour de France giving French people their first look at a map of France really a first sense of how the country fitted together because it was a big national event narrated through newspapers with a huge circulation that stitched the country together for them beating of the bounds kind of thing and Italy explicitly politicised the bicycle race in the, in the 20th century, in the early 20th century. The, the, the first Giro d'Italia after the, the, the Second World War was rechristened the Giro of Rebirth. And it was this sense of uniting a country that had all, all obviously been far more fragmentary in his, historical terms than, than many other European ones. I suppose I did begin to think of Curing as that kind of a way of looking, you know, discovering unlooked for spaces. And, and, and certainly you kind of... You get this privileged access to parts of the city that even walkers aren't really allowed access to, such as, you know, under giant, uh, giant, um, you know, more London and those kind of huge in, uh, commercial developments. 
that function as these little isolated outposts with their own rules and their own systems that you can't really get into unless you're on unless you work there whereas as a courier you're granted this kind of anonymity and a right to knock on the goods doors and yeah. get in the goods lifts and see the back the back of the city in that way i mean what's interesting for me right as a as a, as a walker mm. is you tend to think ah oh, no the walker is the primary kind of narrator and and, and kind of uh, person who understands the city you know in mm. your own feet mm. you feel the city through your feet mm. and in your legs and then you're free you're not surviving the instinct I talk about cyclists surviving mm. rather whereas a walker is kind of free to commune with the spirit of the city however um, in your book I like the way you describe the relationship between cycling and what my friend Nick Happy Demetrio terms deep topography in yeah. the sense that you know, you become aware of river valleys even if you weren't looking for them. Yeah, it's a very unconscious thing. Yeah. Because the bike, like water, wants to flow downhill, you kind of unconsciously map these, the paths of least resistance. I mean, I talk about this again quite a lot in the book, but yeah, there's a sense in which getting on a bike makes you attuned to kind of older ways of travel. Graham Robb says this, and I think it's very true. You know, you kind of unconsciously uncover the the simple, the pilgrim paths or the, the hollow ways, the old ways. Um, and that's, that's true, I think. But I also think that kind of urban cycling, as distinct from the kinds of things that happen on the tour or the great road races, which are kind of primarily weirdly r rural events, although we can kind of talk about that a, a bit maybe, um, in that the bike and the kind of modern city grew up alongside each other really right especially cool. somewhere in new you know if you look at the new city somewhere like new york but, but road surfaces are completely dependent on the advocacy of bike groups you know people think that the roads were built for cars but as carlton reed has argued very persuasively i think in a recent book he he says that you know it was it was bicycle touring clubs in the early 20th century and late 19th early 20th century that really advocated for mass macadamization of the road network so in a sense inhabiting streets of course pavements <laughs> a contested battleground perhaps in this relationship between walker and cyclist but streets themselves i think were kind of they're parallel developments so it was it seemed like the, the bike was actually a very appropriate way in which to encounter a city